I still wonder what my life would be like if I never stopped at that roadside stand in the middle of nowhere. My friends Max, Kim, and I were celebrating our last camping trip of the summer. And when we saw those ripe watermelons shining in the sun, we knew we had to buy one. While Max smoked and Kim knocked on the watermelons like she was hunting for buried treasure, I examined the knickknacks for sale inside the little wooden stand. Pottery from a local artist, embroidered signs, fruit preserves and honey, and the strangest wooden statues I'd ever seen in my life. They were shaped like men, but stretched. Something about the sickening thinness of their arms, legs, and torsos gave my gut a nasty twist. Their clothing was made from stitched together scraps. Their beards were hay or dried moss. Their eyes were tiny colored stones that glittered in the gloom. I reached out for one. I see you've noticed the tall man. The old woman's voice in the shadows made me jump. How long had she been sitting in the darkness watching me? Despite the summer heat, she was wrapped head to toe in a wool shawl. Her rocking chair creaked as she leaned back and forth. Tall man? I took the bait. Oh, it's just a story the local kids tell. The woman flashed me a toothless grin. You can read it on the pamphlet you get with one of these statues when you buy one. I make them myself, you know. I could see where this was going. How much for one of the, uh, tall men? At just that moment, Kim came running up with an enormous watermelon. I finally picked one, she panted. Do you charge by the pound or... For the melon and the tall man, I'd call it an even ten dollars. The what? Kim mouthed at me. You don't have a college discount, do you? I joked. There was no response but the creaking of the shopkeeper's rocking chair. I looked around at the dusty jars and weird statues. It looked like it had been ages since anyone had bought anything but produce from this woman. I lay a ten dollar bill on a silver tray and the woman nodded to a stack of pamphlets beside the tall men. Pick anyone you like, she grinned. By the way, from the looks of all that gear falling off of your car, you young folks look like you're going camping. I'd steer clear of not holler if I were you. Well, that's ominous, <laughs> Kim laughed. But seriously, why? What's there? Read the pamphlet. The old woman leaned back in her chair. You'll see. Who's your creepy new friend? Max asked as I slid into the back seat with my prize. Uh, Timmy, I invented. Timmy the tall man. Am I supposed to know what that means? Max snorted as I buckled Timmy's seatbelt. It had started as a joke, but there was something eerily lifelike about the tall man statue that prevented me from just throwing it on the floor with all our groceries. If I touched its whittled arms, would I feel bark or skin? Would it suddenly look up at me with hate in those beady black eyes? I swear, Kim snickered. You get into the weirdest shit sometimes, but that's what I love about you. I forced a smile, wondering for the thousandth time if Kim's love for me could ever turn into something more than just friendship. I hid my reddening face with the old woman's pamphlet and began to read out loud. The Northwest has the Sasquatch. The Southwest has the Chupacabra. The Northeast has the Jersey Devil. Here in the Southeast, we have the Tall Men. The legend begins with Ezekiel Knott, who moved to Arabella in 1780 with her four sons and three daughters. The family settled in a rugged, hard to access valley that became known as Knott's Holler. No one knew how the Knott's got by on such a desolate patch of land, or even what they ate or drank. In time, however, folks noticed something unusual about the knots. They weren't growing older like everyone else. Instead, they were just becoming taller. It was only a few inches at first, but by the time Ezekiel Knott celebrated his 110th birthday, the difference was too obvious to ignore. Folks said that the knots' arms were so long that their knuckles dragged along the ground, and that their heads were so high they could peer into second-story windows. Their stretched out chests made a wheezing sound that could be heard from far away. Animals refused to go into Knot Holler, where only thorns, weeds, and other stranger plants could grow. Soon, the knots became little more than a folktale to people of Arabella. 
no knot had been seen in decades, and only the oldest residents claimed to remember the horrifying nights when the tall men walked their streets. In the winter of 1918, however, a rash of disappearances near Arabella sparked new interest in the tall men. With no other explanation for the crimes, folks began to wonder if there might be some truth to the legend. That spring, Arabella buzzed with preparations for an expedition to Knott's Holler. By the summer of 1918, however, it was clear that something had gone horribly wrong. Folks had stopped hearing news from their acquaintances in Arabella, and when a concerned family member visited the town, she found it completely abandoned. Doors hung off hinges, glass door fronts were shattered, and a few buildings had even been burned to the ground. Some blamed the flu pandemic, but many suspected that the people of Arabella had paid the price for disturbing the tall men of Knott Holler. Although Arabella was never resettled, the legend of the tall men lives on to this day in stories, folk art, and even in the local tradition of shuttering second-story windows at night. Let me get this straight, Max chuckled after I finished reading. You paid for that? Hey, I was supporting the local economy. I kicked the back of his seat. Be gentle with my car, guys, Kim scolded. There's not a lot holding it together, and I'd hate to break down out here. Yeah, Max scoffed. The tall men might get us. Seriously, knock it off. Are you even remembering to navigate? The GPS has gone haywire, and there's no reception out here. See for yourself. Max was right. On the screen, we were just a blue dot in a wildly spinning sea of green. Fortunately, I'm always prepared. Max brandished a brand new paper map. Look, we just passed Post Ridge Road, so we've only got, oh, 20 more miles or so before our turnoff. This camping spot you picked out, Kim began. It's not anywhere near Knott's Holler, is it? Why? Max grinned. You scared? Just because a story isn't 100% true, doesn't mean there's nothing to be afraid of. I rolled my eyes. Those mysterious disappearances could mean sinkholes or wild animal attacks. And what about the part about how only thorns grow in Knott's Holler, and the way Arabella was suddenly abandoned? For all we know, the whole area is radioactive. You don't need monsters to have a reason to stay away from a place like that. To put your fragile minds at ease, Max sighed. Knott's Holler and Arabella aren't even listed on the map. To be honest, I doubt those places even exist. Our campsite is just two miles off the road in a national forest, at a little spot called Revel's Rest. It wasn't easy to find, you know. The least you two could do is show a little gratitude. All right, all right. Just keep your eyes on the map. Kim squirmed in the driver's seat, trying to see which turn she should take. I could understand why she was nervous, and it had nothing to do with the creepy wooden statue strapped into the seat beside me. Kim's car wasn't in the best shape, and the quality of the roads seemed to get worse every time we turned. I couldn't remember the last time we'd seen a gas station, and something was unnerving me about the few houses that we passed. Maybe it was just coincidence, but they all had their second-story shutters closed and locked. We drove in tense silence for several miles. Kim focused on the road, Max tracing his finger along the map, me staring out the window at the endless forest. Here! Max shouted suddenly, and we all jumped. Kim spun the steering wheel hard to the right, and the suspension lurched as we skidded onto a gravel road. Kim glared at Max. Sorry. Anyway, we've pretty much made it. This is Revel Creek Road. The road wound down a roller coaster steep hill into a narrow valley where light couldn't reach. In the shadow of the hills, everything became the same rich blue-green color. I stuck my hand out the window and felt how the air had a chill, even in summer. A creek burbled somewhere off to the left. We crept along through potholes and high weeds, with Kim cursing Max the entire way. The overgrowth closed in from all sides until I could hardly see the road, and then, suddenly, we were through. Beautiful sunlit meadows stretched out in all directions beside a peaceful creek. A couple of locals waved to us from their fishing spot, and I spotted a ring of five unoccupied campsites up ahead. What'd I tell you? Max shouted. It's perfect! I had to agree. Incredible views of the rocky hills, no crowds, and the cool breeze even felt like it might keep the mosquitoes at bay. 
We barely had to walk 20 feet to get to our campsite, which, given our cheap equipment and haphazard packing, was a blessing. While I unloaded the car, Max set up the tent and Kim walked down to the creek to dip her feet in the frigid water. I set up Timmy the tall man beside the tent entrance, a sort of good luck charm for our camp. Max stretched out with his hands behind his head and a sprig of grass between his teeth. Don't look now, Max muttered under his breath, but it looks like we've got company. The two fishermen who we'd seen earlier were strolling down the gravel lane to our campsite. One was a white haired old man in a worn out mechanics jumpsuit with Dave on the name tag. The other wore wraparound glasses and a tank top that showed off his spindly sunburned arms. He looked to be Dave's son. I'm surprised to find y'all down here, Dave commented. It's a pretty unknown spot. It wasn't easy to find, I can tell you that, Max replied smugly. You see that? The young man elbowed his father and nodded to my tall man's statue. City people really will buy anything, won't they? I doubt they even know what it is. I've heard the story, I snapped back. Oh yeah? The young man sneered and took a step toward me. I suddenly felt very alone in the empty valley. If these people wanted to hurt us, we were a hundred miles from any help. My son Travis is just riled up because the fish always seem to get away from him. Whether Dave was making a casual comment about fishing or a profound statement about his son's success in life, I never found out. Travis shot a murderous glare at all of us, kicked dirt, and stomped back to the truck. Dave cleared his throat. <clears throat> well, just keep out of the backwoods and you'll probably be fine. He clapped me on the shoulder and hurried off after his son. What was that all about? Kim asked from right behind me, making me jump. She was fresh from the creek, water droplets still sparkled in her hair. As Dave and his son rolled past in their truck, Travis stared at her in a way that made my hands clench into fists. Beside me, Max was shivering in his t-shirt. Who wants to help me get a fire going? The flickering flames, Kim's beef stew, and a bottle of bourbon helped to put my mind at ease. The valley opened out around us on all sides. If Travis or anything else approached, we'd be able to see them, or so I hoped. With the warm firelight on its wooden face, even the statue of Timmy the tall man looked content. Everything was going fine until... Where's Kim? I looked around suddenly. Max had been telling yet another one of his long winded jokes and spaced out. And now, she was gone. Don't know, Max shrugged. Huh, anyway, Kim! I shouted, springing to my feet. Kim! No response came from the dark trees, not at first. Then I heard it, a loud raspy moaning sound, like air being forced through a long tube. I ran toward the source of the noise and straight into Kim. Ow, can't a girl take a leak in peace? She huffed. Sorry, I just... I was grateful that the darkness hid my blushing face. Don't worry. Kim stood and buttoned her jeans. Did you hear something just now? Something like? Neither of us could say exactly what it sounded like, but I had an awful feeling that I read a description of it earlier that day. Their stretched out chests made a wheezing sound that could be heard from far away. The old woman's pamphlet, the tall men. From Kim's nervous silence, I could tell she was thinking the same thing. We walked back to the fire. What were you two doing out there all alone in the dark? Max slurred. I saw that he'd polished off most of the bourbon. As much as I'd love to mess with your dirty mind, Max, I got up at 6 a.m. this morning and drove almost five hours straight. Kim <sighs> I'm going to bed. The prospect of a warm sleeping bag sounded a lot better than listening to any more of Max's bad jokes. I followed Kim into the tent and seconds later, heard the hiss of Max putting out the fire. As always, the three of us jostled, kicked, and banged into each other for a few minutes before we found comfortable positions. But when we did, we all fell immediately asleep. I couldn't tell what woke me up first. The moon's pale glow barely filtered through the tent fabric. There was no sound but the babbling of the stream and wind in the tall grass. But the door of the tent was unzipped and Max's sleeping bag was empty. I crawled over the ruffled mess of my friend's sleeping area and looked out the tent flap. 
I was about to whisper his name when I realized that the hair on the back of my neck was standing straight up. My instincts were screaming at me to keep quiet, but why? The moonlit meadows were empty. Shh, 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 someone hissed, and my heart leapt into my throat. There was no way that was Max. You sure this is the one, man? A young voice whispered. Motherfucker, do you see any other tents around here? Now shut up. I thought I heard one of them moving around in there. I froze, hardly daring to breathe. I was suddenly, painfully aware of everything. The cool night air, the smell of wet ashes, my full bladder, and the boozy dinner sloshing around in my stomach. Now, just like I said, we pull the poles out of the tent on three. The first voice whispered. I would have sworn I recognized it from somewhere. You three beat the shit out of the two guys, and I'll grab the girl. You gotta see her, Drew. She's a beaut. You always give yourself first dibs, don't you, Trav? Trav. Travis. I felt around beneath my camp pillow until my fingers closed around my pocket knife. It was no lethal weapon, but its cold metal weight felt good in my hand. One. I shook Kim awake, one finger pressed over my lips. Two. The moment Kim heard the voice and saw that Max was missing, she understood. With quiet and patience that amazed me, she unzipped her sleeping bag, slipped out of it, and got into a runner's crouch. Three, uh We burst screaming out of the tent just as the suffocating fabric started to fall around us. Kim had grabbed her camping lantern and swung its heavy weight into someone's head as we ran past. Fuck! Travis snarled. Get him, Levi! My bare feet slid in the dewy grass. I heard the sounds of pursuit, the rumble of a motor behind me. Kim, who'd been a track runner in high school, rocketed past me. Headlights closed in, casting our long shadows onto the tree line ahead. I realized with horror that whoever was driving through the meadow behind me was trying to run us down. Brakes squealed as I leapt into the safety of the trees, just in time. But there was still Travis, Drew, and who knew how many others of their low-life friends to consider. Their whoops and hollers echoed through the valley until it felt like there were dozens of them chasing us. Every step drove more sharp twigs and thorns into my tender feet, but I was terrified of losing Kim among the dense trees. Those bastards behind us had brought flashlights. In their wildly searching beams, I caught fleeting glimpses of Kim, a pale foot sticking out from blue pajama pants, a sudden flicker of red hair, but I already knew the truth. I wasn't keeping up. Moments later, I lost sight of her completely. My lungs burned. I was desperate to shout her name, but I knew that would only draw the attention of our pursuers. A hand shot out from the trees and grabbed my waistband. Over here, Kim whispered, pulling me into a pit created by a massive collapsed tree. Bugs and salamanders scurried out of the way as we hunched down in the fern-covered muck. The flashlights of Travis and his gang were working against them now. We could see where they were, but they couldn't see us. Kim pressed against me, shuddering. Now that we were no longer running, I felt the cold in my bones. Kim was slightly better off in her thick blue pajamas, but with nothing more than boxers and a t-shirt to cover me, I had to hold my jaw to keep my teeth from chattering. We covered ourselves the best we could and listened to Travis's gang wear themselves out. They hadn't even had the stamina to chase down a couple of surprised college kids, and now the uphill trudge through the forest was taking its toll. But where was Max? As the flashlight beams flickered through the trees, I heard it again, a loud, rasping moan. The same one I'd heard when I'd gone looking for Kim earlier. It sounded a lot closer. Our pursuer seemed to have heard it too. They're gone, Trav. The one identified as Drew whined. It was fun spooking them and all, but we ought to head back to the truck. Fuck that. Travis snarled from further uphill. I didn't come all the way out here for nothing. Drew's right. Levi added doubtfully. We're getting too far in. He sounded worried and something about his tone called to mind what David said. Just keep out of the backwoods and you'll probably be fine. What had he meant? What was further back in these woods? They can't have gone this far. Travis panted. Spread out. The one called Drew turned left. His flashlight pointed straight toward us. In a few minutes, he'd be walking right over top of our hiding spot. Kim tugged on my sleeve. I got the message. We headed deeper into the woods. Our shins banged against fallen trees, thorns scraped our faces, and I could barely even feel my feet anymore. At least, not until I stubbed my toe on something square and rocky. 
We were on the edge of some sort of clearing. No, not a clearing, a ruin. Crumbling chimneys reached up like skeletal fingers from kudzu-covered mounds where homes and stores had once stood. Moonlight illuminated letters on the half-crumbled brick wall in front of me. Era, post, off. Kim squeezed my hand. She didn't like this place any better than I did, but thorn bushes and vines choked the forest on all sides. We had no choice but to cross it. I remembered another phrase from the old woman's weird pamphlet. Animals refused to go into Knot Holler, where only thorns, weeds, and other stranger plants could grow. Suddenly I realized what the letters ahead were meant to say. Era Post Off was Arabella Post Office. We were standing in the town from the legend, probably only a few miles from Knot Holler itself. And if the town was real, what if the rest of the story was as well? More shouts and hollering echoed up from behind us. The beam of a flashlight passed across Kim's terrified face. We had to hurry, but I tread carefully. If I stepped on a rusty nail or shattered glass with my already bleeding bare feet, it was over. Travis and his crew would make me pay for the chase through the woods. And if they caught Kim, I shook the horrible images out of my head and kept walking. To my surprise, there was a sort of path through the overgrown town. At first, I thought it had been made by passing animals. Later, I realized it had to be something much bigger. It was like the plants had been crushed by enormous steps. Something glinted in one of the huge footprints up ahead. Oh God, Kim whispered. She bent down and picked up Max's glasses. One of the lenses was cracked. There was no time to wonder how they'd gotten into the abandoned town. Travis and his crew had reached the corner of the abandoned post office. It was cave black beneath the canopy of brambles and vines overhead. If I hadn't been holding Kim's hand, I wouldn't have even known she was there. The further we went, the more wrong the whole thing felt. The briars on either side of us were practically a wall, and there was no way off of the eerily perfect path. I couldn't help but wonder what had cut this trail through such thick foliage, and what might be waiting at the end of it. I couldn't help but think that it seemed made for something very thin and very tall. Suddenly, a frantic conversation echoed up from the trailhead behind us. This is too far, Trav. Drew's voice boomed out. You're fucking nuts if you think I'm going in there. Go back then. You always were a coward. You and your whole family. The sudden boom of a pistol made me duck. Jesus! The young one, Levi, squealed. Run then, the both of you! Travis roared. But I'm gonna get what I came for, one way or another. I silently prayed that it wasn't just a trick or a trap. Even if Travis was armed, we stood a chance if it was two against one. It was too bad that the trail was too narrow for an ambush. In fact, it wasn't long before we were turning sideways to avoid being cut by the long, hideous thorns. I couldn't see them, but they brushed against my skin like knife points. Kim halted and bit down a yelp as one of them dug into her shoulder. When I pulled it out, I realized that it was longer than my thumb. We held each other, shaking, listening to each other's heartbeats. The claustrophobia, exhaustion, and fear were getting to us, but I could see a faint light up ahead, just a little further. Then everything seemed to happen at once. The beam of Travis's flashlight appeared behind us, and that weird wheezing roar sounded up ahead. This time though, it sounded almost joyful. Fear twisted my guts into a knot when I heard another one, no, two of the sounds. But we had to keep moving forward. Travis was moving faster than we were already. His flashlight allowed him to see, and he clearly had a gun. Kim and I squeezed forward as quickly as we dared. The dirt turned to slick mud as the trail plunged downhill. And by the time we reached its end, we were walking through weirdly warm, knee-high water. The path led to a stagnant pool with a cairn of bone-white boulders at its center, from which a hot spring flowed. When I saw what lay on the stony altar and the three figures around it, I had to cover my mouth to hold in my scream. The old woman's sculptures hadn't prepared me for the terrible reality of the tall men. Their skin was the bluish-white color of blind, cave-dwelling things that never see the light of day. Fungus grew in their stringy, waist-length beards. They reached out for what lay on top of the pale boulder, pulling it apart with arm-length fingers that had far too many joints. 
The thing on the boulder moaned and tried helplessly to squirm away like a fish that had been gutted while still alive. It was Max. His blood poured down the pale stone, turning the spring water crimson in the moonlight. As Kim and I hid behind a rock, my foot slipped on something that felt like a human bone. I hated myself for watching and doing nothing, but I couldn't look away from the gruesome sight. The tall men were stretching as they ate. With each bite they took from my friend's body, I could hear new vertebrae forming in their backs, their legs and fingertips extended. And I realized that this was the secret of Not Holler. This was how Ezekiel Nod and his children had managed to survive without food or water. This was the key to their long lifespans, an unearthly white altar that offered immortality in exchange for blood and transformation. I was so captivated by the awful scene that I forgot all about Travis until he came crashing down the path and into the spring, holding his oversized pistol and flashlight. His bad teeth glistened in the moonlight when he saw us. Got you now, he sneered. One of the tall men crossed the murky pool with three long strides, grabbing Travis around the waist with its multi-jointed fingers. The pistol shots were deafening in the narrow holler, but even when his shots found their mark, they had no effect. His shrieks were the loudest I'd ever heard, until the tall man slammed his spine onto the pale altar with a sickening crack. One of the other tall men turned around, sniffing. It was looking at our hiding spot. Could they somehow smell us? Was that how they found Max in the first place? He took a step toward us, then turned back to the altar. The feast was already underway, and it didn't want to miss a single bite. Kim and I crept back to the unnatural pathway, rock and bone slick beneath our feet. I didn't dare to look backward over my shoulder. One slip, one splash, and we'd be done for. The whetstone gave way to mud and dirt. The sky grew brighter behind the thorns. By the time we reached the ruins of Arabella, I was looking at something I thought I'd never see again, a sunrise. Kim and I didn't have the strength to talk during our walk back through the woods. I think we were both just doing our best to process what we'd experienced. Walking back out into the misty valley felt like a dream. The tall grass had been torn up by the tires of Drew's pickup, but my tent and Kim's car was just how we'd left them. We put on all the warm clothes we had and did our best to clean our wounds in the creek. Then Kim finally spoke. We have to go. We have to tell someone. As we drove back, I kept expecting one of the tall men to step out from the foggy trees, blocking our escape. When we finally pulled into the parking lot at the gas station and bait shop, I couldn't tell if daylight had protected us or if we'd just gotten lucky. The chime rang over the door and five tired old faces turned to greet us. One of them was familiar, Dave. He watched Kim and I carefully as we limped over to their table. My friend, dead, down by Revel's rest, need help, I rambled. Now hold on, son, a big bald man squeezed my arm. Where? He was probably using one of the new maps. A trucker who hadn't even looked up from his coffee rolled his eyes. The out-of-towners who made them heard Arabella West and wrote it down as Revel's Rest. Bad juju, if you ask me. There's a lot of strange stories about that old town, Arabella. My granny used to tell me to never go down there at night. Good fishing, though, another trucker chimed in. Well, you two shut up, the big man groaned. These kids are in trouble. Now you two just sit down and rest. Clint here will quit running his mouth and bring you some hot coffee and breakfast. Breathe. Take your time. Jesus! The man called Clint snorted. Look at those two. They look like they've just seen a tall man. Clint, Dave spoke up suddenly. Just hurry up with that coffee. With one eye on Dave, I did my best to tell our story. I didn't mention Travis by name. If the five fishermen found out that we were involved in the death of a local, no matter how justified it was, I felt sure that things would turn ugly for us. In the end, I didn't have to. The moment I mentioned the drunken gang that showed up outside our tent, Dave's face turned to anger, then sadness, then finally acceptance. The big man called the police. Clint busied himself with our breakfast. The true truckers made excuses and left. We were left alone with Dave. Travis isn't coming home, is he? Kim and I looked at each other. I shook my head. Whatever happened, 
I don't blame you two. That boy was digging his own grave since the day he was born. Dave sighed, then glanced over his shoulder nervously. Look, while you were down there, did you see... He didn't need to finish his sentence. I nodded. So you're not planning on going back down there, right? Kim and I exchanged a glance. We couldn't imagine why anyone would go back to Knott's Holler after learning its secret. We didn't understand. Not then. We didn't know about the strange pull of the pale altar. It's been 40 years now since Kim and I escaped from Knott's Holler, and I still dream about it every night. The way the white stone glitters in the moonlight, the bewitching sound of spring water trickling into the misty pool, and the stretched, shadowy shapes surrounding it. For a long time, I was able to ignore the dreams, long enough to marry, have two children, get divorced, and start over in another town. Long enough to not be surprised when I received the diagnosis. Stage four, inoperable. I've come to realize just how precious every moment of life is. I want more of it, eons more. I find myself wondering what it would be like to camp in Arabella West again. Would my silly little tall man statue still be there? And if, by chance, there were some campers nearby, would I really mind taking them on a little walk down to Knott's Holler? Would I really mind being just a little bit taller? Thanks for listening. If you enjoy these stories, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and check out some more of my episodes here.